Uh, all right, 1 Timothy chapter 5. As we continue our study in Paul's epistle to Timothy, we have got a long section here about widows. Now, we said that Timothy was pastoring Ephesus at the time Paul wrote this letter. And we've noted that there are probably some things going on in the church at Ephesus that had to be dealt with. This seems to be another case. For him to write this much about widows and how to take care of widows, you would think that there was a situation there in the church at Ephesus uh, concerning their need to take care of the widows in that church. So he's going to continue his instruction on how to have proper order in the local church. Talks about our relationship with one another as members of the church. Uh, he starts off uh, talking about the elders. Verse 1, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. The elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters, with all purity. So there's that relationship that we need to cultivate in a church. We are a family. And we need to look at one another. We are the children of God, as we talked about this morning. We're born into the family of God, which makes us brothers and sisters. And seriously, we need to think of one another in that sense. We need to love one another as brothers and sisters. And care for one another. And that's so important for a church to be strong in the Lord. Uh, the word elder there is not talking about pastors, it's talking about the older members of the church and how that they should be respected and uh, we should listen to them. Them is me now. I used to talk about the elders as them, but I guess we should, I need to say us. Three score and ten, I guess I belong there now. But uh, it's important that you know, it bothers me or it, it amazes me really how many churches today just run the elders off? They just concentrate on the young folks, the young families, and uh, kowtow everything to the youngsters and ignore the old folks, you know, what they need and what they should have and uh, don't care if they come or not. We need the elder. We need us elders. You need us. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Because we've been around the block a few times. We know what's going on. We know what it's all about. And uh, the wisdom of the elders is important to a church. Then he goes into this lengthy discussion on the needs of the widows in the church. And it seems Paul has a great compassion for the widows. And uh, maybe because he created quite a few widows himself. He made a widow out of Stephen's wife. Amen. There was people that he was guilty of persecuting and, and being involved in their death. And a lot of these men that were put to death left a lot of widows behind, didn't it? And I, maybe that was on Paul's mind a lot. He wanted the Gentile churches to send funds back to help the poor saints in Jerusalem and Judea because of all the persecution that they were suffering. So he's going to talk a little bit about how the church can take care of the widows in their congregation. Let's take it with verse number 3. Honor widows that are widows indeed. And I'll explain that here a little bit in a minute. But if any widow have children or nephews, and really the Greek there, that's more pertaining to grandchildren. But anybody in the family, she has relatives that can help her, that they should do that. Let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents. For that is good and acceptable unto God. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate, that's the idea. A widow indeed is talking about those who don't have a family to take care of. They don't have children, they don't have grandchildren, nieces, nephews. They are widows indeed. They are desolate. Trusteth in God, continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. 
But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if he provide not for his own, his own family, especially those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. That just means an unbeliever. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works. And she hath brought up children, and she lodged strangers, and she's washed the, the saints' feet, and she's relieved the afflicted, and she has diligently followed every good work. But the younger widows refuse. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation, because they have cast off their first faith. And when though they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, not only idle but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. If any man or woman that believeth hath widows, let them relieve them. Let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. All right, let's look at this tonight and see what we can learn as a church and how we can minister to the widows that might be in our charge and our care. Let's break this down. First, let's talk about the reliable widow. This is kind of described in verses 3 through 10. And it's broken down into several sections here. First of all, concerning her respect. Under the law of Moses, a woman that was left widowed and childless was automatically married to the brother of the deceased. And the first child born to that marriage took the name of the widow's first husband to keep that name alive in Israel. Uh, let me read that to you. Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 and 6. He said, If brethren dwell together, and one of them die, and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her, and take her to him to wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she bears shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead. That his name be not put out of Israel. I guess if you lived back then, you took a lot of interest in who your brother married. Amen. You said, now, brother, I want a little input on this. Just in case something happens to you. Wouldn't you? Sure you would. But that's how it was back then. Remember uh, Ruth and Boaz? That was the case there. Ruth's husband died, and they returned to Bethlehem, and she married Boaz, a near kinsman, and Jesus came through that lineage. They were the grandparents, the great-grandparents of David. And through David's family, Jesus came. So in the Levitical law, there was these laws concerning destitute widows to protect them and to keep their property in the family. So he says, honor widows that are widows indeed. We ought to appreciate the widow's worth, first of all, as a sister in Christ and give her proper respect. But when he says widows indeed, he's talking about the women who were left without any financial support. Not just women who lost their husbands in death, but those who lost everything when the husband passed away. No grandchildren, no family to take care of her. She is destitute. She is a widow indeed, as brought out here. And that day and time was... Not uncommon that uh, women, when they lost their husband, would not have any income. There was nothing that they could fall back on. And so 
Such women were to be taken care of by the church. If she was a member of the church, her husband died, the church was responsible. If she had no family, if she was a widow indeed, the church was responsible to take care of her needs. I think about the, the widow in Luke chapter 2 who gave herself to the service of the temple when her husband died. Her name was Anna. She'd only been married seven years when her husband died. But instead of remarrying, it says that Anna gave herself to the service of the ministry and she just found a place in the temple where she could serve her Lord. She just kind of married herself to the Lord for the rest of her life. And she's about 90-something years old when Jesus is born and her parent, their parents brought him to the temple. And she saw the Christ child and rejoiced in that. But it says in Luke 2, 36, she served God with fasting and prayers night and day. She gave thanks for the child, spoke of him to all that looked for redemption. Same thing you see here is concerning her resources. Write this verse down, James 1, 27. James says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless, the orphans, and widows in their affliction. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. So part of our service is we need to make sure we take care of the orphans and the widows that might be in our congregation. We need to make sure that their needs are taken care of. And uh, first of all, the family should do this. If the widow has family, brothers, sisters, children, grandchildren, even nieces and nephews, they should be taking care of this woman, this kindred, and not expect others to do that. But if she has nobody, then she's a widow indeed. And the church needs to step in. Now, I understand that the culture that Paul's writing here is a lot different from ours today. They didn't have Social Security back then. They didn't have the state taking care of people like this like we do today. So a lot of people are covered by Social Security, by such things as that, by our state. And they didn't have that back then. And yet, there's still some that may still struggle, even with that assistance. They may need help. And so the church needs to be always ready and willing to reach out and help our elderly members who are in need and take care of those needs for them. We do have a benevolence fund here. And we set that aside years ago. And that's a fund set aside to help our members. Not just the elderly members, but any members that uh, need financial assistance. So we set that aside. And our, our deacons do a good job of taking care of that. But we try to... If you've got a financial need and you need help, you can come to your church. You can come to your deacon, and we can help you out in that. We've helped out many people uh, down through the years. But uh, it's sad today that there are many who depend upon the state or the church to take care of their family members. They won't really lift a finger to help them. And uh, like you said here, you're worse than an infidel. If you're like that. Amen. Take care of your family. Because uh, uh, God expects you to. Take care of those in your family that need help. And don't depend on others to do that for you. A widowed mother in the home can be a benediction. And a blessing to that family. Her presence in that family. It might require some changes. But what a blessing, if she's a child of God and she loves the Lord Jesus Christ, what a blessing she can be in that home with her love and her prayers that she can give. So care for them because it's good and it's acceptable before God. Amen. It's God's will that we support the aged, the widows, those who stand in need of help. We've already noted that uh, 
in the Sermon on the Mount how Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes about how they in their self-righteousness had loopholes in the law so they didn't have to help the destitute. Over in Matthew 15, verses 4 through 9, he talks about one of those loopholes where instead of taking care of their parents, they would say, well, uh, I've dedicated all my money to the temple. It's all been given to God, and so I'm sorry, Mom, I can't help you. They might be wealthy people who have a lot of money can help, and yet they found a loophole to keep them from having to support their own parents because they've de dedicated that to the temple. Jesus uh, rebuked them for that kind of an attitude. He denounced that hypocrisy, and it should be. Number three, concerning her reactions, we see in verses 5 through 7. He talks about the widow who acts in a wise way, verse 5. The bereaved widow who has no children to take care of her. Uh, he speaks of her desolation, her dedication, her devotion to God is all brought out here. You now, even Jesus, can you, can you remember a time Jesus reached out to help a widow? How about one that was on the way to the cemetery with her son? Remember that story? Jesus met a funeral procession. And a woman had lost her son. She was a widow woman. Her husband is gone. Now her son is gone. And they're on the way to the cemetery. Jesus stops the procession and raises that boy back to life. Amen. Amen. I wish I could do that sometimes in some of these funerals. Wouldn't that be something? Be able to stop the funeral and say, hey, let's just... Uh... Now some would want to come back. Amen. <laughs> They say, Brother West, don't do that in my case. You just let me stay in heaven. Don't you try to bring me back. You younger folks might maybe, but uh, some of us older folks, we just soon go on and enjoy time in heaven. But uh, Jesus did something for that widow, giving her her son back so he could take care of his mother. But uh, he, he encourages widows to trust in God, to rest in God and put their hope there in him, trust in him for their needs. And a wise widow is going to do that. But then in verse 6 and 7, he talks about the widow who reacts in a worldly way. He talks about those who live in pleasure and is dead while she liveth. Some render that is killing her own soul. Because after their husband has passed, uh, there's this idea of just seeking the pleasure of this world to satisfy their needs and their desires. And because of this, uh, such women were not to be taken. Evidently, the church had a, had a place for widows where they could come and uh, serve the Lord in the church and do certain things, and the church kind of put them on funds to take care of their financial needs. What he's warning them, he's warning the church uh, not to overdo that. There are some women who are widows indeed that should be taken care of. There are others, the younger widows, he goes on to say only those over 60 should be counted worthy of this. Those under 60 should seek to remarry and have a family, have a home. And uh, so he's telling the church be careful about subsidizing the lifestyle of a carnal woman. And uh, whereas the pious woman could be supported, there were others that uh, should not be taken under this care. Uh, these women need to set their affection on things above, not on things of the world, as Colossians 3, 2 says. Verse 8, concerning her relations. He comes back to the widow who does have relations to care for her. Seems to have little patience with those who claim to be Christians and yet will not take care of their own family. Again, he says they're worse than an infidel. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? Worse than a, even the pagans will take care of their own. 
And it's just not right for children of God to have family members that are in need and they turn a blind eye and not help these family members. They would rather the church take care of them. I've had, I've been here a long time, 34 years. And uh, I remember way back, it's been years ago, we had a lady in our church and she kept coming to the church wanting help with financial needs and we tried to help her all we could. But she had grown children. She had a pretty large family. And I asked her once, I said, uh, can, can your family not help you at all with your financial needs? You keep coming to the church. You know, we're limited what we can do. There's just so much we can do financially. She said, oh, Brother West, I wouldn't want to burden them with this. I would rather the church take care of all my bills. I don't want to ask my family to do that. That didn't sit very well with me, you know. That's your family. Amen. And they should. And they knew her situation and they didn't offer to help her. They, they just like the church paying her bills. But uh, we need to be careful about that kind of thing. Because we need to be wise with the Lord's resources. Amen. Amen. But those who refuse to help their own. Well, what's the Bible say? Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. One of the Ten Commandments is honor thy father and thy mother. Right? Amen. That thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now here's that commandment with the promise. God promises to bless those who will honor their parents. And one way you honor your parents is take care of them. Amen. Amen. Is that not right? Amen. You honor them by taking care of them when they are elderly, when they are in need of help. Refusing to extend the love of Christ to a, a widowed mother or aunt or grandmother, that demonstrates a pretty hard heart, really. And it's a sad thing that it's so prevalent in our day and time. Uh, number nine, concerning her reception. About receiving them into the church's uh, consideration, the benevolent funds they've set up for women like this. And there are some guidelines about which women they should bring into this to receive this. He gives two guidelines to take into account maturity and monogamy. The phrase taken into the number seems to indicate that certain widows were enrolled as recipients of church funds. They were taken in by the church and cared for. But again... Only a widow over the age of 60 was to be considered. The younger women uh, able but more so to care for themselves or to remarry. And then verse 10 concerning her reputation. Two questions should be asked before a widow is added to the, to the care of the church. Basically, is she a good person and is she a giving person? Does she have a good reputation for having a godly life? That she has done good works. That there's evidence of this, like with Anna and others we read about in the Bible. And is she a giving person? Has she brought up children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? Has she been hospitable in lodging strangers? Has she been humble? Talks about her washing the feet of others. That was a lowly job for the servants. But Jesus was willing to do it, wasn't he? Amen. He washed the feet of his apostles to show humility and service one to another. So look at her home. Look at her hospitality. Look at her humility. Look at her heart. Has she relieved the afflicted? Look at her helpfulness. Has she been diligent? in doing good and giving of herself. Like the Bible says, Luke 6, 38, Give, and it shall be given unto you. If you live a life of giving, 
And I think God's going to see to it that when you have a need, others will be given to you. Right? You be a giver, and when you need help, there will be people to give to you. God's going to see to it that that happens. Reminds me of what you know, Mary came and washed the feet of Jesus. And after all she had done, and there were some that criticized her for doing it. But I like what Jesus said about Mary. He tells us to leave her alone. She hath done what she could. That's what he said about Mary. She hath done what she could. No more, no less. You know, God expects that of us. God expects us to do what we can. He doesn't expect us to do more than we can, obviously. But we should do what we can with what we have. Then we note the reluctant widow, verses 11 through 15. We see a refusal in verse 11. The church was to refuse the younger widows who could take care of themselves and could remarry. And the desire for younger women to remarry was fine and dandy. And there's no reason why they shouldn't. They could remarry and still have maybe a family and a home. But there's also a looking at the reason. It seems that Paul's saying if you take younger widows into this cause and uh, they're being taken care of for their service to the church, Maybe after a while, they uh, re- decide that they don't want to do this. They decide, well, maybe, maybe I should remarry. And so maybe they made a vow to the church to do this, but then they break that vow in order to marry or live the life of a woman in that sense. So he talks about the damnation here regarding, I think, her physical life, a sin unto death. There's also the idea of condemnation here and uh, just having a sense of guilt and not keeping her pledge to the church. So he says with the younger widows, maybe you ought to take a wait and see stance with them. I know all this sounds strange to us because we're in a different time. Amen. We're in a different time than that. That's 2,000 years ago, a different culture. But these were things that... uh, they had to do to take care of their elders. There would be other things we can do. Not so much exactly as they did it, but we should always keep in mind that we've got members that might need to be taken care of. And uh, say, well, that's the deacon's job. Well, it is part of it, but all of us have responsibility in taking care of our elderlies, our shut-ins. We've got some members who are shut-in. They cannot leave. They cannot get out and do anything, and we need to make sure they're taken care of. And we got some women here and some people that are really good. Sister Marquita is great about this. She is a widow's friend. She keeps in touch with a lot of these ladies. and Some of others do that too, and I appreciate you uh, being kind and, and uh, thinking about these people and their needs. And uh, more of us need to get involved in that. We see a recrimination in verse 13. There's a danger a young widow supported by the church might learn to be idle, he said. Uh, God doesn't intend any of us to be idle. We need to find something to do, to get involved in, and uh, not to be a busybody, not to be a gossiper, but to find something you can do to bless the church and bless your fellow members. And look at the recommendation, verses 14 and 15. It'd be better for the younger women to look for a husband, have a family, because Satan's always ready to attack those who are vulnerable. So we need to be, we need to safeguard both the widow and the church in this regard. He said some have already turned aside after Satan. There were some actual cases, maybe there in Ephesus, where something had happened along this line. Then the last thought, verse 16, is just the related widow. If any man or woman that believeth hath widows, 
If you've got widows in your home and your family, relieve them. Take care of them. Let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. So take care of those in your family that need help. We see a precaution here. First line of support for these women is their family. Whether it's a widow, a bereaved, an unemployed, the sick, the poor. That takes in a lot more than just widows, doesn't it? But take care of the members of your family. And don't expect others to do that for you. And we see a provision. Let them relieve them. You remember the old TV show, The Waltons? When I, was, when I was studying this, they kind of came to mind because that's the way it was back in the old days that you had the extended family all together and uh, they loved one another and cared for one another. I think we've lost something, folks. In our day and time, I think we've lost something very precious that our forefathers knew and enjoyed. And we should try to maybe get some of that back. And we see the proposal, let not the church be charged. Church funds should be reserved for those who have no other means of support, no family to take care of them. As I said, we have an evidence fund here, and we do have certain guidelines that uh, regulate our benevolence fund. There's a limit to how much we can give to certain people, and uh, our deacons, as I said, they take care of this behind the scenes. This is not ever done in front of the church body. We don't want to embarrass anybody. But it's done behind the scenes, and the deacons make sure that these are legitimate needs and that we can do as much as we can to help them in their time of trouble. But I think at the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to be judged. We're going to be judged for how we treat others. As a church, how well do we take care of those who are in need? And uh, we shouldn't turn a blind eye to their needs, but we should do what we can to help them. We are a family. Amen? We are a family. So we need to take care of one another. We're blood kin, you know that? We're blood kin. So, well, we're all descendants of Noah. I guess that makes us blood kin. But you know, another way, we're all under the blood of Christ. We've all been washed by the blood of Christ. So we're blood kin. We need to love one another. We need to take care of one another. And let one another know the needs that we might have in our church family. Okay?